threat. But before we dive into uh, the movie, before we get into what the movie's about and how it applies to us, I do want to have a, a little bit of a conversation um, about what we're not going to talk about uh, in this movie and, and the reason why. In the movie, there is a lot of discussions and conversations about systemic racism. Uh, it's kind of a common theme throughout the movie from beginning to end. And the reason we're not going to discuss that this morning is because uh, come July and August, I'm going to do a five-week series where we're going to talk about cultural topics, cultural issues, things that are going on right now within uh, our country, within our society. And I believe that conversation is better to have then. Um, and so we're not going over it. We're not disregarding it. I just think it'd be a better time to have a conversation on that when we do that series on, on hot topics that are happening within our society, where we take a look at what is our Christian response to these things. Um, and so we're saved that part of the conversation uh, for then. So, cheaper by the dozen. It's about the Baker family. The Baker family in this remake is a blended family. Uh, the family began with Paul Baker and his wife, Kate, who had daughters, Ella and Harley. They adopted their son, Haresh, who was the best character in the movie. Uh, he's hilarious. But they adopted him when their best friends passed away in a car accident. So they took in Haresh into their family. Kate eventually divorced Paul, but they remained friends. And Kate was that weird person that just showed up at their house and became their family babysitter. It was, even when they moved, she like popped in and woke up the family. Zoe, Paul's wife in the movie, before they were married, was married to football player Dominic Dom Clayton. And they had two children, Deja and DJ. But Dom's celebrity life ended up leading to their divorce between him and Zoe. Zoe took custody of the kids afterwards and met Paul at his restaurant that he had. And they had a conversation about breakfast at lunchtime. And so that led to them uniting, to them opening up a baker's breakfast, where they did breakfast all day long. She was an investor, a partner in the restaurant, and then ultimately led to them getting married. And then they expanded the restaurant. They have two sets of twins, Paul and Zoe. Their children are Luca and Luna and Bronx and B Bailey. Later, uh, the Baker family takes in uh, Paul's nephew, Seth. Seth's mom ended up in rehab, and so he's now living with the family. So trying to manage the chaos of their family, right? Some of us have a family of two kids, five kids, four kids. This zoo is crazy. And so the Bakers are trying to manage their family while focusing in on their restaurant. They've got an investor that they're looking at, that they're seeking to try to take Paul's sauce to, to all stores across the nation. The sauce that Paul created is sweet depending on what you put it on, spicy depending on what you put it on. It, it blends with everything. They're also looking at expanding the restaurant and turning it into a franchise. And they receive a considerable check which allows them to move out of L.A. and into Calabasas, which is Bieber country. And so they move it into that area, but all of that came with a cost. The move, the new life, the glamour, all the stuff that Paul wanted came with a cost. Because with that check, Paul sold off the rights to Baker's breakfast, sold off the rights to his, his sauce, sold off the rights to their restaurant. And a phrase that we see and that we hear throughout the movie is family has each other's backs. And so that's going to be the focus of, of our discussion this morning with Cheaper by the Dozen. Family has each other's backs. How do we do that? How do we live that out? This line Paul used when, when him and Zoe were talking to their children about Seth coming to live with them. They didn't want Seth to come to live with them because he was a troubled youth. He, he was involved in, in gangs. He was involved uh, in, in, in 
in with law enforcement. He got in trouble there. He was just a troubled kid, and they didn't want him coming in and living with them. And so Paul tells them, family has each other's back. Seth is our family. We're going to bring him in, and we're going to have his back. This is also a line that we see at the end of the movie. There's some chaos that happens within the family, within the kids, and how they treat Seth. And Seth runs away. They're able to find Seth. And when they bring him back home, it's because their son DJ tells Seth, family has each other's back. Come home. Come be with us. And so this is a common theme throughout the movie. But here's the thing. This movie used that line as a slogan. It was something to make them feel good, to make them feel like they're a better family. But in reality, their family was falling apart and it was chaotic. But that slogan made them feel good. Having each other's backs is more than just a slogan. It's more than supporting each other during hard times. It's learning how to deal with conflict and how to communicate with one another. And so those are the two things we're going to focus on this morning. How do we deal with conflict? How do we communicate with one another? Because if we can't do those two things, we won't have each other's back. We won't have each other's back in the family setting within our homes, but then we also we won't have each other's back in the family setting of our church. This is the family here. And if we can't do these two things, we truly do not have each other's backs. So let's take a look at the first one, learning to deal with conflict, right? We love that, don't we? If you've got your Bibles, turn over to Matthew chapter 18. If you do not have your Bibles with you, that's okay. It, uh, the verses are going to be on the screen above me, and so you can follow along there. Verses 15 through 17. This is how we deal with conflict. If another believer sins against you, go privately and point out the offense. If the other person listens and confesses it, you have won that person back. But if you are unsuccessful, take one or two others with you and go back again so that everything you say may be confirmed by two or three witnesses. If the person still refuses to listen, take your case to the church. Then, if he or she won't accept the church's decision, treat that person as a pagan or corrupt tax collector. There was a lot of conflict throughout the movie. Paul had conflict with his wife. The children had conflict with one another. Paul had conflict with his investors. Zoe had conflict with, it, with their investors. They had conflict with Kate, uh, Paul's ex-wife. There was a lot of conflict. And the only time that conflict was dealt with was when chaos arose. Because they, the way they dealt with conflict was by not dealing with it. We avoid it. We don't discuss it. We just keep living. We just keep pretending our family is happy because we've got each other's backs. But we're not going to discuss things. We're going to push things aside. There was no proactive conversations of, hey, this is where I see things are going. Hey, why is this going on? Hey, can we talk about our family? Can we sit down and talk about how miserable everybody is about the move to Bieber country? We don't want this. Those things were not happening. Unless it all exploded. Then there was a lot of talking. Then there was some communication going on. But here's the process and how to deal with conflict. Go to the person. Whoever you're in conflict with, go to them. Whether that's a person in your family, whether that's a person within the church, whether that's a family member. See, the, the way we handle conflict biblically is the same way we should handle conflict in the workplace as well. These aren't just Christian principles that we only apply within the context of the church, but this is conflict resolution for the workplace, for home life, for school, for, for, with, with individuals that don't have a relationship with Jesus. Because you go to the person, you have a conversation. If that doesn't work, you take some others along that can help with the dialogue of the conversation. Not take others along that's going to have your back, that's going to support your points, but that can be a mediator. And if that doesn't work, we turn to the church 
we seek out counsel from church leadership. That's why I pointed out our shepherds. Go to them, right? But that's why we have shepherds, to see, oversee spiritual problems within, to give spiritual insight to what's going on. And then lastly, if things still don't go well, and that's when we distance ourselves. See, this is how we should handle conflict. But the reality of it, this is not how we handle conflict. Typically, we don't follow these steps, and I'm guilty of that as well. I don't follow these steps to the T. I think a more common way that we handle conflict today is by going to others and then distance ourselves. Those are the, we've got a two-step process. I'm going to go to others. I'm going to talk about. Uh, I'm going to talk about them to others. Not necessarily in the context of how do I resolve this, but more of I need to get you on my side. I need to gain an army behind me, and then we distance ourselves. We're built up through through the insight that we gave from the from others, uh, affirming that yeah, that individual is not a good person, so you shouldn't have a relationship with them. So we pull back and we distance ourselves. I'm guilty of that. I've done that, and I'm sure if we take an honest look at our lives, we've all done that. And I think more often than not, it's kind of how we deal with conflict. Rarely do we go to one another as the first step. There's a scene where Paul and Zoe are arguing in their bedroom of kind of about uh, the, the, the restaurant and even home life. But it ends with Zoe just saying, I'm going to bed. All right? How many of you use that line? Where you're in the middle of an argument, it's just, I'm going to bed. Or I'm going, fill in the blank. What, what is your outlet? but you remove yourself immediately, right? We distance ourselves from the conversation. We cut it off. It's not happening anymore. We're done. And that's what Zoe did. She went to bed. See, at times we distance ourselves physically by removing ourselves, but I think many times what we end up doing is we distance ourselves emotionally. I'm done. I'm not having this conversation. We're not doing this right now. We'll save it for another time, but another time never comes. And so we just say, I'm not having this. I'm not doing this with you. Those are lines that I've used. Those are lines that I've been called out and saying, how is that beneficial? How is that having your family's back? When we distance ourselves emotionally from one another. And see, before we can learn how to phrase things, how to say things when there's conflict, we need to know what to do. We need to understand the proper conflict resolution, right? We do this in workplaces all the time, right? How many of you sit in meetings in your workplace on conflict resolution, right? Uh, Sometimes there's annual meetings about that. When I used to work for a security company, we would have those conversations all the time. Conflict resolution. Here's a PowerPoint. Here's a video. Send this out. Deal, right? But within the context of the church, we don't always deal with this on how do we deal with conflict, It's first by understanding who we need to go to, who we need to have a conversation with. We get so worked up and so stressed about what's bothering us that oftentimes we create a bigger problem in our mind than what's actually happening, don't we? Or or we play through all the different scenarios. Well, they said this, and because they said this, this is how they said it, so they meant it this way, and it leads to this, right? And the this just keeps rolling. It just keeps going. And then we build it up in our mind, and we're like, all right, right? We, you probably remember, I'm not the only one that's done this, but, you know, when you're younger, you know, standing in the mirror thinking, all right, this is what I'm going to say to them. I'm going to go right up to them. I'm going to tell them, and right, we, we play this out, and we do that today as well. We build it up, and then we go, when we finally have the courage to go have a conversation, we go and we say, you know what, you did this, and then we find out, oh, they didn't mean it that way. We find out it's not their intention. We find out that wasn't what their purpose was. It was an accident, or I misread what was said. And we just spent how much time stressed, 
how much time with a burden on our shoulders, how much time distancing ourselves from one another, and we've hurt a relationship because we've been so built up on the what-ifs. See, the first step in having each other's back is going to one another, is going to the individual, going to the person first when there's conflict. And it's going to the person rather than someone else because the Christian response at times is, I'm going to go to someone else, and let's be honest, that's our way to gossip. I'm going to go seek prayer from someone. When the reality is, I want to go get somebody on my side so that they don't like that person as well. I'm going to go build my team, and what we're doing is we're gossiping. Go to the individual first. Take others along if that doesn't work. Seek counsel from the church, from our ministry organizers, from our shepherds. And then if need be, then that's when we distance ourselves. But distancing ourselves should never be our first action. I think we're seeing that right now culturally. I'm going to step away from my notes here. So this is going to, but we're seeing that with what's going on within our country. With, with the overturning of Roe versus Wade, we can't have dialogue. We can't have conversations. And the amount of comments that I'm seeing of, if you don't agree with me, if you don't side with me, unfriend me and get away from me. It's not how we resolve anything. It's not how we get past anything. Go to the person. Take others along. Seek counsel from the church. Distancing ourselves is a last resort. Second, we have to learn how to communicate. We've got to learn how do we have a conversation? How do we talk to one another when there is conflict? How do we bring up conflict? In the movie, Paul and Zoe are having an argument about the direction of Baker's breakfast and the things that are going on within the company. Zoe is feeling left out because Paul is having all the conversations with the investors and making all the decisions on his own without her, without bringing her in, when she was the one that helped name the restaurant, Baker's Breakfast, when she's the one with the marketing degree, when she's the one that helped revamp his restaurant and turn it into a breakfast icon. And one of the things Paul says to Zoe is us being on the same page means everything to me. Oh, isn't that sweet? Right? But again, another cute slogan with no action behind it. This is why I'm sorry that I picked this movie. It was just slogan after slogan, but nothing backed up what they said. It's a cute slogan to make them feel like they do have each other's back. They are a good family. So, learning to communicate. How do we do that? How do we do that in a healthy way? Have you ever heard of uh, dump truck communication? Have you ever heard anything uh, similar to that? You may have not heard it, but I guarantee you've driven this truck. Okay? What dump truck communication is, is there's a conflict, there's a problem, I don't want to deal with it. I don't want to discuss it. So what we do is we take that problem and we put it in the back of our dump truck. Another problem arises, I don't want to deal with it. I don't like conflict. I don't enjoy those conversations. So I'm going to take that, I'm going to put it in my dump truck. Another conflict comes up and the same thing. We keep taking things and we keep putting it in the back of our dump truck. And what happens eventually is that dump truck is going to get full. We're not going to be able to put anything in there anymore. And what happens is we have a dump truck for each person. And when that dump truck is full, and once that person upsets us, now we're going to communicate, right? Now the dump truck unloads. We pour that sucker. We tip it. We pour it out. And now we start with, here's what you've done. Here's what you did. And we start from the beginning. 
Now we want conflict resolution. And so we start pointing out everything that that individual has ever done, and we get so worked up and talking so fast that the other person can't even get a word into the conversation. We're just going, we're pointing fingers, and it's going and going and going until the truck is unloaded and until we're gassed out. And then we tell the person, you've got nothing to say when they are just beat and exhausted. That's dump truck communication. Now, how many of you have heard or driven dump truck communication? We've all been there. We've all driven that truck. That's not the communication that I'm talking about this morning. How do we communicate? How do we have a healthy conversation about what's going on? Ephesians 4.15 says, Instead, we will speak the truth in love growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. Having each other's backs is learning to speak the truth in love. Having each other's backs is getting rid of the dump truck. Not driving it anymore. But this is going to require us to overcome our fears of the what-ifs put aside our desires to please everyone and have an honest, intentional conversation. That's tough. That's hard. I'm a what-if guy. I'm a, I, 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 I plan the conversations out. I like to plan what I say. And so there'll be times where I know I'm going to have to have a conversation with somebody and I write things out. Like I'll write out my points. I'll write out the things I need to say. And there is even times where in my notes I'll put, if they say this, you say this, right? That's the what if. And then even there's times where I'll write, if they say this, this is how I get out of the conversation. This is how I put the conversation in my dump truck. This is how we stop talking. This is how we move on to something else. Usually it's a sarcastic comment where we start laughing and then we forget what we're talking about. But I avoid it. This is what Paul in the movie struggled with how to speak the truth in love how to communicate how to have a conversation he didn't speak up to his investors on hey before we talk about that let me go get my wife zoe involved in this conversation we can keep going no instead he would lie to zoe why couldn't come get you you were putting the kids to bed you weren't there we had to discuss it now and he didn't have a conversation with Zoe about if he was honest with himself, about willing to do whatever it takes to make his restaurant a franchise. She didn't know he was going to sell off the rights to Baker's Breakfast. She didn't know he was going to sell everything off for a big paycheck. Because he didn't have an honest conversation in truth and love. When truth is absent or love is absent in our communication with one another, disconnection begins. When we leave one of the two out, we start to become disconnected with one another. And I think at times when, when, when we look at our conflict and we look at uh, different things that are going on, we think, well, I'm going to speak the truth right now. I'm going to tell you the truth. But where's the love? behind it. And we back it up by, well, it was true, so that way it was loving for me to say those things because it was, it was honest and real. But the love wasn't, how do I help per this person become a better person? How do I help this person grow? It's more of, I'm going to bring this person down and build myself up. We saw that Paul and Zoe started to become disconnected because truth and love was absent from the way they communicated with one another. Paul went on more trips without Zoe. He was gone a longer time on his trips. Paul was disconnected from what was going on at home and how his family felt about living in Calabasas. See, speaking truth and love is communicating what needs to be said. You're not loving the other person by not sharing what's on your heart. 
You're not loving the other person by not allowing them to grow. But the what ifs hold us back. Or the need to please everybody. And if I bring this to the table, if I bring this conversation, I'm not pleasing my spouse. I'm not making my spouse feel happy. I'm not pleasing my coworker. They're going to be disappointed. But this is exactly what's going on in our culture this weekend. With the reversal of Roe versus Wade. A lot of communication, a lot of just throwing things out, and on both ends, if we're honest. Some of the things that, we, that I've personally seen on Facebook and, and social media from, from pro-choice individuals and from pro-life individuals, I'm thinking, where is the truth and love? We're throwing out a lot of what we feel. But if we can't approach a conversation, especially uh, a tense conversation in truth and love, we're not going to get anywhere. And we're not going to be able to communicate anything if it's not rooted in truth and love. What we see at the end of the movie is that truth prevails. Right? Doesn't it always prevail within our lives? Truth prevails. What solved the chaos in the Baker family was not the restaurant taking off and, and franchises popping up all over Southern California. It wasn't Paul sauce in the grocery store. It wasn't that the fact that the kids had more things than what they needed. What solved their problem was facing the truth. Coming to terms with the truth. The truth about the situation they were in. The truth about Paul being gone all the time and the family being chaotic. Deja goes off on the family. Now, she goes off to kind of get the blame off of her, right? so that distract from what I just did. But she goes off on the family and starts pointing things out to Paul, starts pointing things out that Zoe is miserable. Zoe hates living here. Going on about how Horesh is beat up in the school all the time, pointing out Harley, who's in a wheelchair, is being made fun of because the ramp in front of their house is now an eyesore to the community, telling them everybody's miserable here and the only person that's happy is you and you're not here. The truth finally came out. The truth was finally discussed, but only when chaos exploded over. And so Paul decides to move the family back to L.A. because everyone is unhappy, ends his relationship with his investors, ends the relationship with the sauce, ends the relationship with taking Baker's breakfast and making it a chain, because he realizes the family doesn't want the stuff he's trying to provide them with. The family doesn't want the physical things. The family wants their family to have each other's backs. Not just to say it, but to live it out. To have the actions follow what they're saying. And in a conversation with, with Deja, she tells Paul, or actually Paul tells Deja, Sometimes the most loving thing you can do for someone is to tell them a hard truth that they don't want to hear. Because truth prevails. Truth fixes our problem. 1 John 3.18 says, Dear children, let's not merely say that we love each other. Let us show the truth by our actions. Having each other's backs. Let's not just say that. As a cute slogan to make ourselves feel better the way the bakers did. Let's let our actions show one another. It means we work at our relationships. We put in intentional work into our conversations. It's learning to deal with conflict instead of putting it aside. It's learning how to communicate. It's getting rid of the dump truck in our relationships, and it's understanding the importance of truth. If we can do those three things, we'll have each other's backs. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the family you have given us. 
the family here within our church and the family within our home. Lord, I pray that we don't look at our, at our families as just something we have, but I pray that we look at our families as something more than that, a gift from you, and that we fight for one another, that we would truly have each other's backs, that we would truly learn it's not a slogan. It's not something that, that we just say when, when chaos comes up, but that we live it out throughout our days. We live it out by confronting conflict when it comes up, by having conversations about what's going on, by sharing what's on our heart and not being afraid of the what ifs and getting past the I need to please somebody so therefore I won't have these conversations. Lord, I pray that we learn to do those three things that we've discussed this morning. Confront conflict, communicate, and allow truth to be spoken with love. And if we can do those things, Lord, our families will have each other's backs. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.